Part two, chapter ten, recent comets, part one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California. A popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century by Agnes Mary Clark. Recent Comets, Part One. Chapter Ten Recent Comets. On the second of June, eighteen fifty eight, Giambattista Donati discovered at Florence a feeble round nebulosity in the constellation of Leo, about one tenth the diameter of the full moon. It proved to be a comet approaching the sun but it changed little in apparent place or brightness for some weeks. The gradual development of a central condensation of light was the first symptom of coming splendor. At Harvard, in the middle of July, a strong stellar nucleus was seen. On August 14th, a tail began to be thrown out. As the comet wanted still over six weeks of the time of its perihelion passage, it was obvious that great things might be expected of it, they did not fail of realization. Not before the early days of September was it generally recognized with the naked eye, though it had been detected without a glass at Polkova, August 19th. But its growth was thenceforward surprisingly rapid, as it swept with accelerated motion under the hindmost foot of the great bear and past the starry locks of Berenice. A sudden leap upward in luster was noticed on September 12th when the nucleus shone with about the brightness of the pole star, and the tail, notwithstanding large foreshortening, could be traced with the lowest telescopic power over six degrees of the sphere. The appendage, however, attained its full development only after perihelion, September 30th, by which time, too, it lay nearly square to the line of sight from the Earth. On October 10th, it stretched in a magnificent scimitar-like curve over a third and upwards of the visible hemisphere, representing a real extension in space of fifty-four million miles. But the most striking view was presented on October 5th, when the brilliant star Arcturus became involved in the brightest part of the tail, and during many hours contributed, its luster undiminished by the interposed nebulous screen, to heighten the grandeur of the most majestic celestial object of which living memories retain the impress. Donati's comet was, according to Admiral Smythe's testimony, outdone as a mere sight object by the great comet of 1811, but what it lacked in splendor it surely made up in grace and variety of what we may call scenic effects some of these were no less interesting to the student than impressive to the spectator at polkova on sixteenth september vinica the first director of the strasbourg observatory observed a faint outer envelope resembling a veil of almost evanescent texture flung somewhat widely over the head next evening the first of the secondary tales appeared possibly as part of the same phenomenon this was a narrow straight ray forming a tangent to the strong curve of the primary tail and reaching to a still greater distance from the nucleus it continued faintly visible for about three weeks during part of which time it was seen in duplicate for from the chief train itself at a point where its curvature abruptly changed issued as if through the rejection of some of its materials a second beam nearly parallel to the first the rigid line of which contrasted singularly with the softly diffused and waving aspect of the plume of light from which it sprang. Olber's theory of unequal repulsive forces was never more beautifully illustrated. The triple tail seemed a visible solar analysis of cometary matter. The processes of luminous emanation going on in this body forcibly recalled the observations made on the comets of 1744 and 1835. From the middle of September, the nucleus, estimated by Bond to be under 500 miles in diameter, was the center of action of the most energetic kind. 
seven distinct envelopes were detached in succession from the nebulosity surrounding the head and after rising towards the sun during periods of from four to seven days finally cast their material backward to form the right and left branches of the great train the separation of these by an obscure axis apparently as black quite close up to the nucleus as the sky indicated for the tail a hollow cone-like structure while the repetition of certain spots and rays in the same corresponding situation on one envelope after another served to show that the nucleus to some local peculiarity of which they were doubtless due had no proper rotation but merely shifted sufficiently on an axis to preserve the same aspect towards the sun as it moved round it this observation of bonds was strongly confirmatory of bessel's hypothesis of opposite polarities in such bodies opposite sides the protrusion towards the sun on september twenty fifth of a brilliant luminous fan-shaped sector completed the resemblance to halley's comet the appearance of the head was now somewhat that of a bat's wing gaslight there were however no oscillations to and fro such as bessel had seen and speculated upon in eighteen thirty five as the size of the nucleus contracted with approach to perihelion its intensity augmented on october second it outshone arcturus and for a week or ten days was a conspicuous object half an hour after sunset its lustre setting aside the light derived from the tail was at that date six thousand three hundred times what it had been on june fifteenth though theoretically taking into account that is only the differences of distance from sun and earth it should have been only one thirty-third of that amount here it might be thought was convincing evidence of the comet itself becoming ignited under the growing intensity of the solar radiations yet experiments with the polariscope were interpreted in an adverse sense and bond's conclusion that the comet sent us virtually unmixed reflected sunshine was generally acquiesced in it was nevertheless negatived by the first application of the spectroscope to these bodies very few comets have been so well or so long observed as donati's it was visible to the naked eye during one hundred twelve days it was telescopically discernible for two hundred and seventy five the last observation having been made by mr william mann at the cape of good hope march fourth eighteen fifty nine its course through the heavens combined singularly with the orbital place of the earth to favor curious inspection the tail when near its greatest development lost next to nothing by the effects of perspective and at the same time lay in a plane sufficiently inclined to the line of sight to enable it to display its exquisite curves to the greatest advantage even the weather was on both sides of the atlantic propitious during the period of greatest interest and the moon as little troublesome as possible the volume compiled by the younger bond is a monument to the care and skill with which these advantages were turned to account yet this stately apparition marked no turning point in the history of cometary science by its study knowledge was indeed materially advanced but along the old lines no quick and vivid illumination broke upon its path quite insignificant objects as we have already partly seen have often proved more vitally instructive donati's comet has been identified with no other its path is an immensely elongated ellipse lying in a plane far apart from that of the planetary movements carrying it at perihelion considerably within the orbit of venus and at aphelion out into space to five and a half times the distance from the sun of neptune the entire circuit occupies over two thousand years and is performed in a retrograde direction or against the order of the signs before its next return about the year four thousand a d the enigma of its presence and its purpose may have been to some extent though we may be sure not completely penetrated 
on june thirtieth eighteen sixty one the earth passed for the second time in the century through the tail of a great comet some of our readers may remember the unexpected disclosure on the withdrawal of the sun below the horizon on that evening of an object so remarkable as to challenge universal attention a golden yellow planetary disk wrapped in dense nebulosity shone out while the june twilight of these latitudes was still in its first strength the number and complexity of the envelopes surrounding the head produced according to the late mr webb a magnificent effect portions of six distinct emanations were traceable it was as though a number of light hazy clouds were floating round a miniature full moon as the sky darkened the tail emerged to view although in brightness and sharpness of definition he could not compete with the display of eighteen fifty eight its dimensions proved to be extraordinary it reached upwards beyond the zenith when the head had already set by some authorities its extreme length was stated at one hundred eighteen degrees and it showed no trace of curvature most remarkable however was the appearance of two widely divergent rays each pointing towards the head though cut off from it by sky illumination of which one was seen by mr webb and both by mr williams at liverpool a quarter of an hour before midnight there seems no doubt that Webb's interpretation was the true one, and that these beams were, in fact, the perspective representation of a conical or cylindrical tail hanging closely above our heads, and probably just being lifted up out of our atmosphere. The cometary train was then rapidly receding from the earth, so that the sides of the outspread fan of light shown by it, when we were right in the line of its axis, must have appeared, as they did, to close up in departure the swiftness with which the visually opened fan shut proved its vicinity and indeed mr hinn's calculation showed that we were not so much near as actually within its fold at that very time already monsieur Lier, from his observations at rio de janeiro june eleventh to fourteenth and mr tebbit by whom the comet was discovered in new south wales on may thirteenth had anticipated such an encounter while the former subsequently proved that it must have occurred in such a way as to cause an immersion of the earth in cometary matter to a depth of three hundred thousand miles the comet then lay between the earth and the sun at a distance of about fourteen million miles from the former its tail stretched outward just along the line of intersection of its own with the terrestrial orbit to an extent of fifteen million miles so that our globe happening to pass at the time found itself during some hours involved in the flimsy appendage no perceptible effects were produced by the meeting it was known to have occurred by theory alone a peculiar glare in the sky thought by some to have distinguished the evening of june thirtieth was at best inconspicuous nor were there any symptoms of unusual electric excitement the greenwich instruments were indeed disturbed on the following night but it would be rash to infer that the comet had art or part in their agitation the perihelion passage of this body occurred june eleventh eighteen sixty one and its orbit has been shown by m kreutz of bonn from a very complete investigation founded on observations extending over nearly a year to be an ellipse traversed in a period of four hundred nine years towards the end of august eighteen sixty two a comet became visible to the naked eye high up in the northern hemisphere with a nucleus equaling in brightness the lesser stars of the plough and a feeble tail twenty degrees in length it thus occupied quite a secondary position among the members of its class it was nevertheless a splendid object in comparison with the telescopic nebulosity discovered by temple at marseilles december nineteenth eighteen sixty five this the sole comet of eighteen sixty six slipped past perihelion january eleventh without pomp of train or other appendages and might have seemed hardly worth the trouble of pursuing fortunately 
this was not the view entertained by observers and computers since upon the knowledge acquired of the movements of these two bodies has been founded one of the most significant discoveries of modern times the first of them is now styled the comet eighteen sixty two three of the august meteors the second eighteen sixty six one that of the november meteors the steps by which this curious connection came to be ascertained were many and were taken in succession by a number of individuals but the final result was reached by Schiaparelli of Milan, and remains deservedly associated with his name. The idea prevalent in the eighteenth century as to the nature of shooting stars was that they were mere aerial ignis fatui, inflammable vapors accidentally kindled in our atmosphere. But Halley had already entertained the opinion of their cosmical origin, and Chladni, in 1794, formally broached the theory that space is filled with minute circulating atoms which drawn by the earth's attraction and ignited by friction in its gaseous envelope produce the luminous effects so frequently witnessed acting on his suggestion brandes and betzenberg two students at the university of Göttingen, began in seventeen ninety eight to determine the heights of falling stars by simultaneous observations at a distance they soon found that they move with planetary velocities in the most elevated regions of our atmosphere and by the ascertainment of this fact laid a foundation of distinct knowledge regarding them some of the data collected however served only to perplex opinion and even caused chladni temporarily to renounce his many high authorities headed by laplace in eighteen o two declared for the lunar volcanic origin of meteorites but thought on the subject was turbid and inquiry seemed only to stir up the mud of ignorance it needed one of those amazing spectacles at which man assists no longer in abject terror for his own frail fortunes but with keen curiosity and the vivid expectation of new knowledge to bring about a clarification on the night of november twelfth or thirteen eighteen thirty three a tempest of falling stars broke over the earth north america bore the brunt of its pelting from the gulf of mexico to halifax until daylight with some difficulty put an end to the display the sky was scored in every direction with shining tracks and illuminated with majestic fireballs at boston the frequency of meteors was estimated to be about half that of flakes of snow in an average snowstorm their numbers while the first fury of their coming lasted were quite beyond counting but as it waned a reckoning was attempted from which it was computed on the basis of that much diminished rate that two hundred and forty thousand must have been visible during the nine hours they continued to fall now there was one very remarkable feature common to the innumerable small bodies which traversed or were consumed in our atmosphere that night they all seemed to come from the same part of the sky. Traced backward, their paths were invariably found to converge to a point in the constellation Leo. Moreover, that point traveled with the stars in their nightly round. In other words, it was entirely independent of the Earth and its rotation. It was a point in interplanetary space. The effective perception of this fact amounted to a discovery, as Olmsted and Twining, who had simultaneous ideas on the subject, were the first to realize. Denison Olmsted was then professor of mathematics in Yale College. He showed early in 1834 that the emanation of the showering meteors from a fixed radiant proved their approach to the earth along nearly parallel lines, appearing to diverge by an effect of perspective and that those parallel lines must be sections of orbits described by them round the sun and intersecting that of the earth for the november phenomenon was now seen to be a periodical one on the same night of the year eighteen thirty two although with less dazzling and universal splendor than in america in eighteen thirty three it had been witnessed over great part of europe and in arabia Olmsted accordingly assigned to the cloud of cosmical particles, or 
comet, as he chose to call it, by terrestrial encounters with which he supposed the appearances in question to be produced, a period of about 182 days. Its path and narrow ellipse meeting near its farthest end from the sun, the place occupied by the earth on November 12th. Once for all, then, as the result of the starfall of 1833, the study of luminous meteors became an integral part of astronomy. Their membership of the solar system was no longer a theory or a conjecture. It was an established fact. The discovery might be compared to, if it did not transcend in importance, that of the asteroidal group. C'est un nouveau monde planétaire, Arago wrote qui commence à se révéler à nous. Evidences of periodicity continued to accumulate. It was remembered that Humboldt and Bonpland had been the spectators at Cumana after midnight on November 12, 1799, of a fiery shower little inferior to that of 1833, and reported to have been visible from the equator to Greenland. Moreover, in 1834 and some subsequent years, there were waning repetitions of the display, as if through the gradual thinning out of the meteoric supply. The extreme irregularity of its distribution was noted by Olbers in 1837, who conjectured that we might have to wait until 1867 to see the phenomenon renewed on its former scale of magnificence. This was the first hint of a 33- or 34-year period. The falling stars of November did not alone attract the attention of the learned. Similar appearances were traditionally associated with August 10 by the popular phrase in which they figured as the tears of St. Lawrence. But the association could not be taken on trust from medieval authority. It had to be proved scientifically, and this quetelet of Brussels succeeded in doing in December 1836. A second meteoric revolving system was thus shown to exist, but its establishment was at once perceived to be fatal to the cosmical cloud hypothesis of Olmsted. For if it be a violation of probability to attribute to one such agglomeration a period of an exact year, or sub-multiple of a year, it would be plainly absurd to suppose the movements of two or more regulated by such highly artificial conditions. An alternative was proposed by Adolf Ehrmann of Berlin in 1839. No longer in clouds, but in closed rings, he supposed meteoric matter to revolve around the sun. Thus, the mere circumstance of intersection by a meteoric of the terrestrial orbit, without any coincidence of period, would account for the Earth meeting some members of the system at each annual passage through the node or point of intersection. This was an important step in advance, yet it decided nothing as to the forms of the orbits of such annular assemblages, nor was it followed up in any direction for a quarter of a century. Hubert A. Newton took up in 1864 the dropped thread of inquiry. The son of a mathematical mother, he attained, at the age of twenty-five, to the dignity of professor of mathematics in Yale University, and occupied the post until his death in 1896. The diversion of his powers, however, from purely abstract studies, stimulated their effective exercise, and constituted him one of the founders of meteoric astronomy. A search through old records carried the November phenomenon back to the year 902 A.D., long distinguished as the Year of the Stars, for in the same night in which Teramina was captured by the Saracens and the cruel Aglabite tyrant Ibrahim ibn Abed died, by the judgment of God, before Cosenza, stars fell from heaven in such abundance as to amaze and terrify beholders far and near. This was on October 13th, and recurrences were traced down through subsequent centuries, always with a day's delay in about seventy years. It was easy, too, to derive from the dates a cycle of thirty-three and a quarter years, so that Professor Newton did not hesitate to predict the exhibition of an unusually striking meteoric spectacle on November 13th through 14th, 1866. For the astronomical explanation of the phenomena, recourse was had to a method introduced by Ehrmann of computing meteoric orbits. It was found, however, 
that conspicuous recurrences every thirty-three or thirty-four years could be explained on the supposition of five widely different periods combined with varying degrees of extension in the revolving group professor newton himself gave the preference to the shortest of three hundred and fifty four and a half days but indicated the means of deciding with certainty upon the true one it was furnished by the advancing motion of the node or that day's delay of the november shower every seventy years which the old chronicles had supplied data for detecting for this is a strictly measurable effect of gravitational disturbance by the various planets the amount of which naturally depends upon the course pursued by the disturbed bodies here the great mathematical resources of professor adams were brought to bear by laborious processes of calculation he ascertained that four out of newton's five possible periods were entirely incompatible with the observed nodal displacement while for the fifth that of thirty-three and a quarter years a perfectly harmonious result was obtained this was the last link in the chain of evidence proving that the november meteors or leonids as they had by that time come to be called revolve round the sun in a period of thirty three point two seven years in an ellipse spanning the vast gulf between the orbits of the earth and uranus the group being so extended as to occupy nearly three years in defiling past the scene of terrestrial encounters but before it was completed in march eighteen sixty seven the subject had assumed a new aspect and importance professor newton's prediction of a remarkable star shower in november eighteen sixty six was punctually fulfilled this time europe served as the main target of the celestial projectiles and observers were numerous and forewarned the display although according to mr baxendale's memory inferior to that of eighteen thirty three was of extraordinary impressiveness dense crowds of meteors equal in lustre to the brightest stars and some rivalling venus at her best darted from east to west across the sky with enormous apparent velocities and with a certain determinateness of aim as if let fly with a purpose and at some definite object nearly all left behind them trains of emerald green or clear blue light which occasionally lasted many minutes before they shrivelled and curled up out of sight the maximum rush occurred a little after one o'clock on the morning of november fourteenth when attempts to count were overpowered by frequency but during a previous interval of seven minutes five seconds four observers at mr bishop's observatory at twickenham reckoned five hundred and fourteen and during an hour one thousand one hundred twenty before daylight the earth had fairly cut her way through the star-bearing stratum the ethereal rockets had ceased to fly this event brought the subject of shooting stars once more vividly to the notice of astronomers schiaparelli had indeed been already attracted by it the results of his studies were made known in four remarkable letters addressed before the close of the year eighteen sixty six to father secchi and published in the bulletino of the roman observatory their upshot was to show in the first place that meteors possess a real velocity considerably greater than that of the earth and travel accordingly to enormously greater distances from the sun along tracks resembling those of comets in being very eccentric in lying at all levels indifferently and in being pursued in either direction it was next inferred that comets and meteors equally have an origin foreign to the solar system but are drawn into it temporarily by the sun's attraction and occasionally fixed in it by the backward pull of some planet but the crowning fact was reserved for the last it was the astonishing one that the august meteors move in the same orbit with the bright comet of 1862 that the comet in fact is but a larger member of the family named perseids because their radiant point is situated in the constellation perseus this discovery was quickly capped by others of the same kind de verrier published january twenty first eighteen sixty seven elements for the november swarm founded on the most recent and authentic observations 
at once identified by Dr. C. F. W. Peters of Altona with Apolzer's elements for Temple's Comet of 1866. A few days later, Schiaparelli, having recalculated the orbit of the meteors from improved data, arrived at the same conclusion, while Professor Weiss of Vienna pointed to the agreement between the orbits of a comet which had appeared in 1861 and of a star shower found to recur on April 20th, Lyraides, as well as between those of Biela's comet and certain conspicuous meteors of November 28th. These instances do not seem to be exceptional. The number of known or suspected accordances of cometary tracks with meteor streams contained in a list drawn up in 1878 by Professor Alexander S. Herschel, who has made the subject peculiarly his own, amounts to 76. Although the four first detected still remain the most conspicuous, and perhaps the only absolutely sure examples of a relation as significant as it was, to most astronomers, unexpected. There had indeed been anticipatory ideas, not that Kepler's comparison of shooting stars to minute comets, or Maskelyne's Forza Risultere Ce Essi Sono Comita, in a letter to the Abate Cesaris, December 12, 1774, need count for much. But Chladni, in 1819, considered both to be fragments or particles of the same primitive matter, irregularly scattered through space as nebulae, and Morstadt of Prague suggested about 1837 that the meteors of November might be dispersed atoms from the tail of Biela's comet, the path of which is cut across by the earth near that epoch. Professor Kirkwood, however, by a luminous intuition, penetrated the whole secret so far as it has yet been made known. In an article published, or rather buried, in the Danville Quarterly Review for December 1861, he argued, from the observed division of Biela and other less noted instances of the same kind, that the sun exercises a divalent influence on the nuclei of comets, which may be presumed to continue its action until their corporate existence, so to speak, ends in complete pulverization. May not, he continued, our periodic meteors be the debris of ancient but now disintegrated comets whose matter has become distributed round their orbits? The gist of Schiaparelli's discovery could not be more clearly conveyed, for it must be borne in mind that with the ultimate destiny of comets' tails this had nothing to do. The tenuous matter composing them is, no doubt, permanently lost to the body from which it emanated, but science does not pretend to track its further wanderings through space. It can, however, state categorically that these will no longer be conducted along the paths forsaken under solar compulsion. From the central and probably solid parts of comets, on the other hand, are derived the granules by the swift passage of which our skies are seamed with periodic fires. It is certain that a loosely agglomerated mass, such as cometary nuclei most likely are, must gradually separate through the unequal action of gravity on its various parts, through, in short, solar tidal influence. Thenceforward, its fragments will revolve independently in parallel orbits, at first as a swarm, finally, when time has been given for the full effects of the lagging of the slower-moving particles to develop, as a closed ring. The first condition is still, more or less, that of the November meteors. Those of August have already arrived at the second. For this reason, Le Verrier pronounced, in 1867, the Perseid to be of the older formation than the Leonid system. He even assigned a date at which the introduction of the last named bodies into their present orbit was probably effected through the influence of Uranus. In 126 AD, a close approach must have taken place between the planet and the parent comet of the November stars, after which its regular returns to perihelion and the consequent process of its disintegration set in. Though not complete, it is already far advanced. The view that meteorites are the dust of decaying comets was now to be put to a definite test of prediction. Biela's comet had not been seen since its duplicate return in 1852. 
yet it had been carefully watched for with the best telescopes. Its path was accurately known. Every perturbation it could suffer was scrupulously taken into account. Under these circumstances, its repeated failure to come up to time might fairly be thought to imply a cessation from visible existence. Might it not, however, be possible that it would appear under another form? that a star shower might have sprung from and would commemorate its dissolution? End of Part 2, Chapter 10, Recent Comets, Part 1 Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California Part 2, Chapter 10, Recent Comets, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Carlo, San Clemente, California. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clark. Recent Comets, Part 2. An unusually large number of falling stars were seen by Borondes, December 6, 1798. Similar displays were noticed in the years 1830, 1838, and 1847, and the point from which they emanated was shown by Heiss at Aix-la-Chapelle to be situated near the bright star Gamma Andromeda. Now, this is precisely the direction in which the orbit of Biela's comet would seem to lie as it runs down to cut the terrestrial track very near the place of the Earth at the above dates. The inference was, then, an easy one, that the meteors were pursuing the same path with the comet, and it was separately arrived at early in 1867 by Weiss, D'Arrest, and Gala. But Biela travels in the opposite direction to Temple's comet and its attendant Leonids. Its motion is direct, or from west to east, while theirs is retrograde. Consequently, the motion of its node is in the opposite direction, too. In other words, the meeting place of its orbit with that of the Earth retreats, and very rapidly, along the ecliptic instead of advancing so that if the Andromedes stood in the supposed intimate relation to Biela's comet, they might be expected to anticipate the times of their occurrence by as much as a week in half a century. All doubt as to the fact may be said to have been removed by Signor Tezzioli's observation of the annual shower in more than usual abundance at Bergamo, November 30, 1867. The missing comet was next due at perihelion in the year 1872, and the probability was contemplated by both Weiss and Gala of its being replaced by a copious discharge of falling stars. The precise date of the occurrence was not easily determinable, but Gala thought the chances in favor of November 28th. The event anticipated the prediction by 24 hours. Scarcely had the sun set in Western Europe on November 27th when it became evident that Biela's comet was shedding over us the pulverized products of its disintegration. The meteors came in volleys from the foot of the chained lady, their numbers at times baffling the attempt to keep a reckoning. At Moncarlieri, about 8 p.m., they constituted, as Father Densa said, a real rain of fire. Four observers counted, on an average, 400 each minute and a half, and not a few fireballs, equaling the moon in diameter, traversed the sky. On the whole, however, the stars of 1872, though about equally numerous, were less brilliant than those of 1866. The phosphorescent tracks marking their passage were comparatively evanescent and their movements sluggish. This is easily understood when we remember that the Andromedes overtake the Earth while the Leonids rush to meet it the velocity of encounter for the first class of bodies being under twelve, for the second above forty-four miles a second. The spectacle was, nevertheless, magnificent. It presented itself successively to various parts of the earth, from Bombay and the Mauritius to New Brunswick and Venezuela, and was most diligently and extensively observed. Here it had well-nigh terminated by midnight. 
It was attended by a slight aurora, and although Tacchini had telegraphed that the state of the sun rendered some show of polar lights probable, it has too often figured as an accompaniment of star showers to permit the coincidence to rank as fortuitous. Admiral Wrangel was accustomed to describe how, during the prevalence of an aurora on the Siberian coast, the passage of a meteor never failed to extend the luminosity to parts of the sky previously dark and an enhancement of electrical disturbance may well be associated with the flittings of such cosmical atoms. A singular incident, connected with the meteors of 1872, has now to be recounted. The late Professor Klinkenfuss, who had observed them very completely at Göttingen, was led to believe that not merely the debris strewn along its path but the comet itself must have been in immediate proximity to the earth during their appearance. If so, it might be possible, he thought, to descry it as it retreated in the diametrically opposite direction from that in which it had approached. On November 30th, accordingly, he telegraphed to Mr. Pogson, the Madras astronomer, Biela touched earth November 27th. Search near Theta Centauri the anti-radiant, as it is called, being situated close to that star. Bad weather prohibited observation during thirty-six hours, but when the rain clouds broke on the morning of December 2nd, there a comet was just in the indicated position. In appearance, it might have passed well enough for one of the Biela twins. It had no tail, but a decided nucleus, and was about forty-five seconds across, being thus altogether below the range of naked-eye discernment. It was again observed, December 3rd, when a short tail was perceptible, but overcast skies supervened, and it has never since been seen. Its identity, accordingly, remains in doubt. It seems tolerably certain, however, that it was not the lost comet which ought to have passed that spot twelve weeks earlier, and was subject to no conceivable disturbance capable of delaying to that extent its revolution. On the other hand, there is the strongest likelihood that it belonged to the same system, that it was a third fragment torn from the parent body of the Andromedes at a period anterior to our first observations of it. In thirteen years, Biela's comet, or its relics, travels nearly twice round its orbit, so that a renewal of the meteoric shower of 1872 was looked for on the same day of the year 1885, the probability being emphasized by an admonitory circular from Dunecht. Astronomers were accordingly on the alert, and were not disappointed. In England, observation was partially impeded by clouds, but at Malta, Palermo, Beirut, and other southern stations, the scene was most striking. The meteors were both larger and more numerous than in 1872. Their numbers in the densest part of the drift were estimated by Professor Newton at 75,000 per hour, visible from one spot to so large a group of spectators that practically none could be missed. Yet each of these multitudinous little bodies was found by him to travel in a clear cubical space of which the edge measured twenty miles. Thus the dazzling effects of a luminous throng was produced without jostling or overcrowding by particles. It might also be said isolated in the void. Their aspect was strongly characteristic of the Andromeda family of meteors. They invariably, Mr. Denning wrote, traversed short paths with very slow motions, and became extinct in evolved streams of yellowish sparks. The conclusion seemed obvious that these meteors are formed of very soft materials which expand while incalescent, and are immediately crumbled and dissipated into exiguous dust. The Biela meteors of 1885 did not merely gratify astronomers with a fulfilled prediction, but were the means of communicating to them some valuable information. Although their main body was cut through by the moving earth in six hours, and was not more than 100,000 miles across, skirmishers were thrown out to nearly a million miles on either side of the compact central battalions. Members of the system were, on the 26th of November, 
recorded by Mr. Denning at the hourly rate of about 130, and they did not wholly cease to be visible until December 1st. They afforded, besides, a particularly well-marked example of that diffuseness of radiation previously observed in some less conspicuous displays. Their paths seemed to diverge from an area rather than from a point in the sky. They came so ill to focus that divergences of several degrees were found between the most authentically determined radiance. These incongruities are attributed by Professor Newton to the irregular shape of the meteoroids producing unsymmetrical resistance from the air, and hence causing them to glance from their original direction on entering it. Thus, their luminous tracks did not always represent, even apart from the effects of the Earth's attraction, the true prolongation of their course through space. The Andromedes of 1872 were laggards behind the comet from which they sprang. Those of 1885 were its avant couriers. That wasted and disrupted body was not due at the node until January 26, 1886, sixty days, that is, after the Earth's encounter with its meteoric fragments. These are now probably scattered over more than 500 million miles of its orbits. Yet Professor Newton considers that all must have formed one compact group with Biela at the time of its close approach to Jupiter about the middle of 1841, for otherwise both comet and meteorites could not have experienced, as they seem to have done, the same kind and amount of disturbance. The rapidity of cometary disintegration is thus curiously illustrated. A short-lived persuasion that the missing heavenly body itself had been recovered was created by Mr. Edwin Holmes's discovery, at London, November 6, 1892, of a tolerably bright, tailless comet, just in a spot which Biela's comet must have traversed in approaching the intersection of its orbit with that of the Earth. A hasty calculation by Beberich assigned elements to the newcomer seemingly not only to ratify the identity, but to promise a quasi-encounter with the Earth on November 21st. The only effect of the prediction, however, was to raise a panic among the Negroes of the southern states of America. The comet quietly ignored it, and moved away from, instead of towards, the appointed meeting place. Its projection, then, on the night of its discovery, upon a point of the Biela orbit, was by a mere caprice of chance. North America, nevertheless, was visited on November 23rd by a genuine Andromeda shower. Although the meteors were less numerous than in 1885, Professor Young estimated that 30,000 at the least of their orange fire streaks came, during five hours, within the range of view at Princeton. Bredichin estimated the width of the space containing them at about 2,700,000 miles. The anticipation of their due time by four days implied, if they were a prolongation of the main Biela group, the nucleus of which passed the spot of encounter five months previously, a recession of the node since 1885 by no less than three degrees. Unless, indeed, Mr. Denning were right in supposing the display to have proceeded from an associated branch of the main swarm through which we passed in 1872 and 1885. The existence of separated detachments of Biela meteors due to disturbing planetary action was contemplated as highly probable by Schiaparelli. Such may have been the belated flights met with in 1830, 1838, 1841, and 1847, and such the advance flight plunged through in 1892. A shower looked for November 23, 1899, did not fall, and no further display from this quarter is probable until November 17, 1905, although one is possible a year earlier. The Leonids, through the adverse influence of Jupiter and Saturn, inflicted upon multitudes of eager watchers a still more poignant disappointment. A dense part of the swarm, having nearly completed a revolution since 1866, should, traveling normally, have met the Earth November 15, 1899. In point of fact, it swerved sunward, and the millions of meteorites which would otherwise have been sacrificed for the illumination of our skies escaped a fiery doom. 
the contingency had been forecast in the able calculations of dr johnstone stoney and dr a m w downing superintendent of the nautical almanac office but the verification scarcely compensated the failure nor was the situation retrieved in the following years only ragged fringes of the great tempest cloud here and there touched our globe as the same investigators warned us to expect the course of the meteorites had been not only rendered sinuous by perturbation but also broken and irregular we can no longer count upon the leonids their glory for scenic purposes is departed the comet associated with them also evaded observation although it doubtless kept its tryst with the sun in the spring of eighteen ninety nine the attendant circumstances were too unfavorable to allow it to be seen from the earth by an almost fantastic coincidence nevertheless a faint comet was photographed november fourteenth eighteen ninety eight by dr chase of the yale college observatory close to the leonid radiant whither a meteorograph was directed with a view to recording trails left by precursors of the main leonid body a promising start too was made on the same occasion with meteoric researches from sensitive plates indeed chebele and colton had already in eighteen ninety six determined the height of a leonid by means of photographs taken at stations on different ridges of mount hamilton and professor pickering has prosecuted similar work at harvard with encouraging results everything in this branch of science depends upon how far they can be carried without the meteorograph rigid accuracy in the observation of shooting stars is unattainable and rigid accuracy is the sine qua non for obtaining exact knowledge biela does not offer the only example of cometary disruption setting aside the unauthentic reports of early chroniclers we meet the double comet discovered by Lier at olinda brazil february twenty seventh eighteen sixty of which the division appeared recent and about to be carried farther but a division once established separation must continually progress the periodic times of the fragments will never be identical one must drop a little behind the other at each revolution until at length they come to travel in remote parts of nearly the same orbit thus the comet predicted by klinkerfus and discovered by Pogson had already lagged to the extent of twelve weeks and we shall meet instances farther on where the retardation is counted not by weeks but by years here original identity emerges only from calculation and comparison of orbits comets then die as kepler wrote long ago sicut bombisis filo fundendo this certainty anticipated by kirkwood in eighteen sixty one we have at least acquired from the discovery of their generative connection with meteors nay their actual materials become in smaller or larger proportions incorporated with our globe it is not indeed universally admitted that the ponderous masses of which according to dabre's estimate at least six hundred fall annually from space upon the earth ever formed part of the bodies known to us as comets some follow chermak in attributing to aerolites a totally different origin from that of periodical shooting stars that no clear line of demarcation can be drawn is no valid reason for asserting that no real distinction exists and it is certainly remarkable that a meteoric fusillade may be kept up for hours without a single solid projectile reaching its destination it would seem as if the celestial army had been supplied with blank cartridges yet since a few detonating meteors have been found to proceed from ascertained radiance of shooting stars it is difficult to suppose that any generic difference separates them their assimilation is further urged though not with any demonstrative force by two instances the only two on record of the tangible descent of an aerolite during the progress of a star shower on april fourth ten ninety five the saxon chronicle informs us that stars fell so thickly that no man could count them and adds that one of them having struck the ground in france a bystander cast water upon it which was raised in steam with a great noise of boiling and again 
On November 27, 1885, while the skirts of the Andromeda tempest were trailing over Mexico, a ball of fire was precipitated from the sky at Mazapil within view of a ranchman. Scientific examination proved it to be a siderite or mass of nickel iron. Its weight exceeded eight pounds, and it contained many nodules of graphite. We are not, however, authorized by the circumstances of its arrival to regard the Mazapil fragment of cosmic metal as a specimen torn from Biela's comet. In this, as in the preceding case, the coincidence of the fall with the shower may have been purely causal, since no hint is given of any sort of agreement between the tracks followed by the sample provided for curious study, and the swarming meteors consumed in the upper air. Professor Newton's inquiries into the tracks pursued by meteorites previous to their collisions with the Earth tend to distinguish them, at least specifically, from shooting stars. He found that nearly all had been traveling with a direct movement in orbits, the perihelia of which lay in the outer half of the space separating the Earth from the Sun. Shooting stars, on the contrary, are entirely exempt from such limitations. The Yale professor concluded that the larger meteorites moving in our solar system are allied much more closely with the group of comets of short period than with the comets whose orbits are nearly parabolic. They would thus seem to be more at home than might have been expected amid the planetary family. Father Carbonell has, moreover, shown that meteorites, if explosion products of the Earth or Moon, should, with rare exceptions, follow just the kind of paths assigned to them from data of observation by Professor Newton. Yet it is altogether improbable that projectiles from terrestrial volcanoes should, at any geological epoch, have received impulses powerful enough to enable them not only to surmount the Earth's gravity, but to penetrate its atmosphere. A striking, indeed an almost startling, peculiarity, on the other hand, divides from their congeners a class of meteors identified by Mr. Denning during ten years' patient watching of such phenomena at Bristol. These are described as meteors with stationary radiance, since for months together they seem to come from the same fixed points in the sky. Now, this implies quite a portentous velocity. The direction of meteor radiance is affected by a kind of aberration analogous to the aberration of light. It results from a composition of terrestrial with meteoric motion. Hence, unless that of the Earth in its orbit be, by comparison, insignificant, the visual line of encounter must shift, if not perceptively from day to day, at any rate conspicuously from month to month. The fixity, then, of many systems observed by Mr. Denning seems to demand the admission that their members travel so fast as to throw the Earth's movement completely out of the account. The required velocity would be, by Mr. Raynard's calculation, at least 880 miles a second, but the aspect of the meteors justifies no such extravagant assumption. Their seeming swiftness is very various, and what is highly significant, it is notably less when they pursue than when they meet the Earth. Yet the incredible and unaccountable fact of the existence of these long radiants, although doubted by Tisserand because of its theoretical refractoriness, must apparently be admitted. The first plausible explanation of them was offered by Professor Turner in 1899. They represent, in his view, the cumulative effects of the Earth's attraction. The validity of his reasoning is, however, denied by Monsieur Berlichin, who prefers to regard them as a congeries of separate streams. The enigma they present has evidently not yet received its definitive solution. The Perseids afford, on the contrary, a remarkable instance of a shifting radiant. Mr. Denning's observations of these yellowish leisurely meteors extend over nearly six weeks, from July 8th to August 16th, the point of radiation meantime progressing no less than 57 degrees in right ascension. Doubts as to their common origin were hence freely expressed, 
especially by Mr. Monk of Dublin. But the late Dr. Kleiber showed, by strict geometrical reasoning, that the 49 radiants successively determined for the shower were all, in fact, comprised within one narrowly limited region of space. In other words, the application of the proper correction for the terrestrial movement and the effects of attraction by which each individual shooting star is compelled to describe a hyperbola around the Earth's center reduces the extended line of radiance to a compact group with the cometary radiant for its central point, the cometary radiant being the spot in the sky met by a tangent to the orbit of the Perseid comet of 1862 at its intersection with the orbit of the Earth. The reality of the connection between the comet and the meteors could scarcely be more clearly proved. While the vast dimensions of the stream into which the latter are found to be diffused cannot but excite astonishment not unmixed with perplexity. The first successful application of the spectroscope to comets was by Donati in 1864. A comet discovered by Temple, July 4th, brightened until it appeared like a star somewhat below the second magnitude with a feeble tail thirty degrees in length it was remarkable as having on august seventh almost totally eclipsed a small star a very rare occurrence on august fifth donati admitted its light through his train of prisms and found it thus analyzed to consist of three bright bands yellow green and blue separated by wider dark intervals this implied a good deal comets had previously been considered as we have seen to shine mainly if not wholly by reflected sunlight they were now perceived to be self-luminous and to be formed to a large extent of glowing gas the next step was to determine what kind of gas it was that was thus glowing in them and this was taken by Sir William Huggins in 1868. A comet of subordinate brilliancy, known as Comet 1868-2, or sometimes as Vinica's, was the subject of his experiment. On comparing its spectrum with that of an oleophant gas vacuum tube rendered luminous by electricity, he found the agreement exact. It has since been abundantly confirmed. All the 18 comets tested by light analysis between 1868 and 1880 showed the typical hydrocarbon spectrum common to the whole group of those compounds, but probably due immediately to the presence of acetylene. Some minor deviations from the laboratory pattern in the shifting of the maxima of light from the edge towards the middle of the yellow and blue bands have been experimentally reproduced by Fogel and Hasselberg in tubes containing a mixture of carbonic oxide with oleophant gas. Their illumination by disruptive electric discharges was, however, a condition sine qua non for the exhibition of the cometary type of spectrum. When a continuous current was employed, the carbonic oxide bands asserted themselves to the exclusion of the hydrocarbons. The distinction has great significance as regards the nature of comets. Of particular interest in this connection is the circumstance that carbonic oxide is one of the gases evolved by meteoric stones and irons under stress of heat, for it must apparently have formed part of an aeriform mass in which they were immersed at an early stage of their history. In a few exceptional comets, the usual carbon bands have been missed. Two such were observed by Sir William Huggins in 1866 and 1867, respectively. In each, a green ray, approximating in position to the fundamental nebular line, crossed an otherwise unbroken spectrum. And Holmes's comet of 1892 displayed only a faint prismatic band devoid of any characteristic feature. Now these three might well be set down as partially effete bodies, but a brilliant comet, visible in southern latitudes in April and May 1901, so far resembled them in the quality of its light as to give a spectrum mainly, if not purely, continuous. This, accordingly, is no symptom of decay. The earliest comet of first-class luster to present itself for spectroscopic examination was that discovered by Coggia at Marseille, April 17, 1874. Invisible to the naked eye till June, 
it blazed out in July a splendid ornament of our northern skies, with a just perceptibly curved tail, reaching more than halfway from the horizon to the zenith, and a nucleus surpassing in brilliancy the brightest stars in the swan. Bredichin, Fogel, and Huygens were unanimous in pronouncing its spectrum to be that of marsh or oleophant gas. Father Secchi, in the clear sky of Rome, was able to push the identification even closer than had heretofore been done. The complete hydrocarbon spectrum consists of five zones of variously colored light. Three of these only, the three central ones, had till then been obtained from comets, owing, it was supposed, to their temperature not being high enough to develop the others. The light of Kogia's comet, however, was found to contain all five traces of the violet band emerging June 4th, of the red July 2nd. Presumably, all five would show universally in cometary spectra were the dispersed rays strong enough to enable them to be seen. The gaseous surroundings of comets are, then, largely made up of a compound of hydrogen with carbon. Other materials are also present, but the hydrocarbon element is probably unfailing and predominant. Its luminosity is, there is little doubt, an effect of electrical excitement. Zollner showed in 1872 that, owing to evaporation and other changes produced by rapid approach to the sun, electrical processes of considerable intensity must take place in comets, and that their original light is immediately connected with these and depends upon solar radiation rather through its direct or indirect electrifying effects than through its more obvious thermal power, may be considered a truth permanently acquired to science. They are not, it thus seems, bodies incandescent through heat, but glowing by electricity, and this is compatible under certain circumstances with a relatively low temperature. The gaseous spectrum of comets is accompanied, in varying degrees, by a continuous spectrum. This is usually derived most strongly from the nucleus, but extends more or less to the nebulous appendages. In part, it is certainly due to reflected sunlight, in part most likely to the ignition of minute solid particles. End of Part 2, Chapter 10, Recent Comets, Part 2 Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California Part 2, Chapter 11 of A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clark. Part 2, Chapter 11, Part 1 Recent Comets Continued The mystery of comets' tales had been to some extent penetrated, so far, at least, that by making certain assumptions strongly recommended by the facts of the case, their forms can be, with very approximate precision, calculated beforehand. We have, then, the assurance that these extraordinary appendages are composed of no ethereal or supersensual stuff, but of matter such as we know it, and subject to the ordinary laws of motion, though in a state of extreme tenuity. Olbers, as already stated, originated in 1812 the view that the tails of comets are made up of particles subject to a force of electrical repulsion proceeding from the sun. It was developed and enforced by Bessel's discussion of the appearances presented by Halley's Comet in 1835. He, moreover, provided a formula for computing the movement of a particle under the influence of a repulsive force of any given intensity, and thus laid firmly the foundation of a mathematical theory of cometary emanations. Professor W. A. Norton of Yale College considerably improved this by inquiries begun in 1844, 
and resumed on the apparition of Donati's comet, and Dr. C. F. Pape at Altena gave numerical values of the impulses outward from the sun, which must have actuated the materials respectively of the curved and straight tails adorning the same beautiful and surprising object. The physical theory of repulsion, however, was, it might be said, still in the air. Nor did it even begin to assume consistency until Zona took it in hand in 1871. It is perfectly well ascertained that the energy of the push or pull produced by electricity depends, other things being the same, upon the surface of the body acted on, that of gravity upon its mass. The efficacy of solar electrical repulsion relatively to solar gravitational attraction grows, consequently, as the size of the particle diminishes. Make this small enough, and it will virtually cease to gravitate, and will unconditionally obey the impulse to recession. This principle, Zöllner, was the first to realize in its application to comets. It gives the key to their constitution. Admitting that the sun and they are similarly electrified, their more substantially aggregated parts will still follow the solicitation of his gravity, while the finely divided particles escaping from them will, simply by reason of their minuteness, fall under the sway of his repellent electric power. They will, in other words, form tails. Nor is any extravagant assumption called for as to the intensity of the electrical charge concerned in producing these effects. Zollner, in fact, showed that it need not be higher than that attributed by the best authorities to the terrestrial surface. Forty years have elapsed since M. Bredeking, director successively of the Moscow and the Pokova observatories, turned his attention to these curious phenomena. His persistent inquiries on the subject, however, date from the appearance of Kogius Comet in 1874. On computing the value of the repulsive force exerted in the formation of its tail, and comparing it with the values of the same force arrived at by him in 1862 for some other conspicuous comets, it struck him that the numbers representing them fell into three well-defined classes. This idea was confirmed on further investigation. In 1882, the appendages of thirty-six well-observed comets had been reconstructed theoretically, without a single exception being met with to the rule of the three types. A further study of forty comets led, in 1885, only to a modification of the numerical results previously arrived at. In the first of these, the repellent energy of the sun is fourteen times stronger than his attractive energy. The particles forming the enormously long straight rays projected outward from this kind of comet leave the nucleus with a mean velocity of just seven kilometers per second, which, becoming constantly accelerated, carries them in a few days to the limit of visibility. The great comets of 1811, 1843, and 1861, that of 1744, so far as its principal tail was concerned, and Halley's Comet at its various apparitions, belonged to this class. Less narrow limits were assigned to the values of the repulsive force employed to produce the second type. For the axis of the tail, it exceeds by one-tenth the power of solar gravity. For the anterior edge, it is more than twice, for the posterior only half as strong. The corresponding initial velocity, for the axis, is 1,500 meters a second, and the resulting appendage a scimitar-like or plumy tail, such as Donati's and Kogia's comets furnished splendid examples of. Tails of the third type are constructed with forces of repulsion from the sun, ranging from one-tenth to three-tenths that of his gravity, producing an accelerated movement of attenuated matter from the nucleus, beginning at the leisurely rate of 300 to 600 meters a second. They are short, strongly bent, brush-like emanations, and in bright comets seem to be only found in combination with tails of the higher classes. Multiple tails, indeed, that is, tails of different types emitted simultaneously by one comet, are perceived, as experience advances and observation becomes closer, to be rather the rule than the exception. Now, 
what is the meaning of these three types is any translation of them into physical fact possible to this question bredechin supplied in eighteen seventy nine a plausible answer it was already a current surmise that multiple tails are composed of different kinds of matter differently acted on by the sun both olbers and bessel had suggested this explanation of the straight and curved emanations from the comet of 1807 norton had applied it to the faint light tracks proceeding from that of donati winnicky to the varying deviations of its more brilliant plumage bredichin defined and ratified the conjecture he undertook to determine provisionally as yet the several kinds of matter appropriated severally to the three classes of tails these he found to be hydrogen for the first hydrocarbons for the second and iron for the third the ground for this apportionment is that the atomic weights of these substances bear to each other the same inverse proportion as the repulsive forces employed in producing the appendages they are supposed to form and Zollner had pointed out in eighteen seventy five that the heliofugal power by which comets tails are developed would in fact be effective just in that ratio hydrogen as the lightest known element that is the least under the influence of gravity was naturally selected as that which yielded most readily to the counter persuasions of electricity hydrocarbons had been shown by the spectroscope to be present in comets and were fitted by their specific weight as compared with that of hydrogen to form tails of the second type while the atoms of iron were just heavy enough to compose those of the third and from the plentifulness of their presence in meteorites might be presumed to enter in no inconsiderable proportion into the mass of comets these three substances however were by no means supposed to be the sole constituents of the appendages in question on the contrary the great breadth of what for the present were taken to be characteristically iron tails were attributed to the presence of many kinds of matter of high and slightly different specific weights while the expanded plume of donati was shown to be in reality a whole system of tails made up of many substances each spreading into a separate hollow cone more or less deviating from and partially superposed upon the others yet these felicities of explanation must not make us forget that the chemical composition attributed to the first type of cometary trains has so far received no countenance from the spectroscope the emission lines of free incandescent hydrogen have never been derived from any part of these bodies dissentient opinions accordingly were expressed as to the cause of their structural peculiarities Rainyard, Zenker, and others advocated the agency of heat repulsion in producing them. Kerr somewhat obscurely explains them through the evolution of gases by colliding particles. Hertz of Vienna concludes tails to be more illusory appendages produced by electrical discharges through the rare medium assumed to fill space. But Hearn conclusively showed that no such medium could possibly exist without promptly bringing ruin upon our deidal earth and its revolving companions. On the whole, modern researches tend to render superfluous the chemical diversities postulated by Bredichin. Electricity alone seems competent to produce the varieties of cometary emanation they were designed to account for. The distinction of types rests on a solid basis of fact, but probably depends upon differences rather in the mode of action than in the kind of substance acted upon. Suggestive sketches of electrical and light pressure theories of comets have been published respectively by Mr. Fessenden of Allegheny and by M. Arrhenius at Stockholm. Although evidently of a tentative character, they possess great interest bredichin's hypothesis was promptly and profusely illustrated within three years of its promulgation five bright comets made their appearance each presenting some distinctly peculiarity by which knowledge of these curious objects was materially helped forward the first of these is remembered as the great southern comet 
it was never visible in these latitudes, but made a short though stately progress through southern skies. Its earliest detection was at Cordova on the last evening of January 1880 and it was seen on February 1st as a luminous streak extending just after sunset from the southwest horizon towards the pole, in New South Wales, at Montevideo, and the Cape of Good Hope. The head was lost in the solar rays until February 4th, when Dr. Gould, then director of the National Observatory of the Argentine Republic at Cordova, caught a glimpse of it very low in the west and on the following evening Mr. Eddy, at Grahamstown, discovered a faint nucleus of a straw-colored tinge about the size of the annular nebula in Lyra. Its condensation, however, was very imperfect, and the whole apparition showed an exceedingly filmy texture. The tail was enormously long. On February 5th it extended, large perspective retrenchment notwithstanding, over an arc of fifty degrees, but its brightness nowhere exceeded that of the Milky Way in Taurus. There was little curvature perceptible, the edges of the appendage ran parallel, forming a nebulous causeway from star to star, and the comparison to an auroral beam was appropriately used. The aspect of the famous comet of 1843 was forcibly recalled to the memory of Mr. Janisch, governor of St. Helena, and the resemblance proved not merely superficial. But the comet of 1880 was less brilliant, and even more evanescent. After only eight days of visibility, it had faded so much as no longer to strike, though still discoverable by the unaided eye, and on February 20th it was invisible with the great Cordoba equatorial pointed to its known place but the most astonishing circumstance connected with this body is the identity of its path with that of its predecessor in eighteen forty three this is undeniable dr gould mr hind and dr copeland each computed a separate set of elements from the first rough observations and each was struck with an agreement between the two orbits so close as to render them virtually indistinguishable can it be possible Mr. Hind wrote to Sir George Airy, that there is such a comet in the system, almost grazing the sun's surface in perihelion, and revolving in less than thirty-seven years? I confess I feel a difficulty in admitting it, notwithstanding the above extraordinary resemblance of orbits. Mr. Hind's difficulty was shared by other astronomers. It would, indeed, be a violation of common sense to suppose that a celestial visitant so striking in appearance had been for centuries back an unnoticed frequenter of our skies. Various expedients, accordingly, were resorted to for getting rid of the anomaly. The most promising at first sight was that of the resisting medium. It was hard to believe that a body, largely vaporous, shooting past the sun at a distance of less than a hundred thousand miles from his surface, should have escaped powerful retardation. It must have passed through the very midst of the corona. It might easily have had an actual encounter with a prominence. Escape from such proximity might, indeed, very well have been judged beforehand to be impossible even admitting no other kind of opposition than that dubiously supposed to have affected Enki's comet, the result in shortening the period ought to be of the most marked kind. It was proved by Oppolzer that if the comet of 1843 had entered our system from stellar space with parabolic velocity, it would, by the action of a medium such as Enki postulated, varying in density inversely as the square of the distance from the sun, have been brought down by its first perihelion passage, to elliptic movement in a period of twenty-four years, with such rapid diminution that its next return would be in about ten. But such restricted observations as were available on either occasion of its visibility gave no sign of such a rapid progress towards engulfment. Another form of the theory was advocated by Klinkerfus, he supposed that four returns of the same body had been witnessed within historical memory, the first in 371 B.C., the next in 1668, besides those of 1843 and 1880. 
an original period of two thousand thirty nine years being successively reduced by the withdrawal at each perihelion passage of one one thousand three hundred and twentieth of the velocity acquired by falling from the far extremity of its orbit towards the sun to one hundred and seventy five and thirty seven years a continuance of the process would bring the comet of 1880 back in 1897. Unfortunately, the earliest of these apparitions cannot be identified with the recent ones unless by doing violence to the plain meaning of Aristotle's words in describing it. He states that the comet was first seen during the frosts and in the clear skies of winter, setting due west nearly at the same time as the sun. This implies some considerable north latitude, but the objects lately observed had practically no north latitude. They accomplished their entire course above the elliptic in two hours and a quarter, during which space they were barely separated a hand's breadth, one might say, from the sun's surface. For the purposes of the desired assimilation, Aristotle's comet should have appeared in March, it is not credible, however, that even a native of Thrace should have termed March winter. With the comet of 1668, the case seemed more dubious. The circumstances of its appearance are barely reconcilable with the identity attributed to it, although too vaguely known to render certainty one way or the other attainable. It might, however, be expected that recent observations would at least decide the questions whether the comet of 1843 could have returned in less than 37, and whether the comet of 1880 was to be looked for at the end of seventeen and a half years. But the truth is that both of these objects were observed over so small an arc, eight degrees and three degrees respectively, that their periods remained virtually undetermined. For while the shape and position of their orbits could be and were fixed with a very close approach to accuracy, the length of those orbits might vary enormously without any very sensible difference being produced in the small part of the curves traced out near the sun. Dr. Wilhelm Meyer, however, arrived by an elaborate discussion at a period of 37 years for the comet of 1880, while the observations of 1843 were, admittedly, best fitted by Hubbard's ellipse of 533 years. But these Dr. Meyer supposed to be affected by some constant source of error, such as would be produced by a mistaken estimate of the position of the comet's center of gravity. He inferred, finally, that, in spite of previous non-appearances, the two comets represented a single regular denizen of our system, returning once in thirty-seven years along an orbit of such extreme eccentricity that its movement might be described as one of precipitation towards and rapid escape from the sun, rather than of sedate circulation round it. The geometrical test of identity has hitherto been the only one which it was possible to apply to comets, and in the case before us it may fairly be said to have broken down. We may then, tentatively, and with much hesitation, try a physical test, though scarcely yet, properly speaking, available. We have seen that the comets of 1843 and 1880 were strikingly alike in general appearance, though the absence of a formed nucleus in the latter and its inferior brilliancy detracted from the convincing effect of the resemblance. Nor was it maintained when tried by exact methods of inquiry, M. Bredechin found that the gigantic raid emitted in 1843 belonged to his type number 1, that of 1880 to type number 2. The particles forming 1 were actuated by a repulsive force ten times as powerful as those forming the other. It is true that a second noticeable curved tail was seen in Chile, March 1st, and at Madras, March 11th, 1843 and the conjecture was accordingly hazarded that the materials composing on that occasion the principal appendage having become exhausted, those of the secondary one remaining predominant, and reappeared alone in the hydrocarbon train of 1880. But the one known instance in point is against such a supposition. Halley's Comet, the only great comet of which the returns have been securely authenticated and carefully observed, 
has preserved its type unchanged through many successive revolutions. The dilemma presented to astronomers by the Great Southern Comet of 1880 was unexpectedly renewed in the following year. On the 22nd of May, 1881, Mr. John Tebbett of Windsor, New South Wales, scanning the western sky, discerned a hazy-looking object which he felt sure was a strange one. A marine telescope at once resolved it into two small stars and a comet, the latter of which quickly attracted the keen attention of astronomers. For Dr. Gould, computing its orbit from his first observations at Cordoba, found it to agree so closely with that arrived at by Bessel for the comet of 1807 that he telegraphed to Europe June 1st announcing the unexpected return of that body. So unexpected that theoretically it was not possible before the year 3346. And Bessel's investigation was one which inspired and eminently deserved confidence. Here, then, once more, the perplexing choice had to be made between a premature and unaccountable reappearance and the admission of a plurality of comets moving nearly in the same path. But in this case, facts proved decisive. Tebbet's Comet passed the sun June sixteenth at a distance of sixty-eight millions of miles and became visible in Europe six days later. It was, in the opinion of some, the finest object of the kind since 1861. In traversing the constellation Auriga on its debut in these latitudes, it outshone Capella. On June 24th and some subsequent nights, it was unmatched in its brilliancy by any star in the heavens. In the telescope, the two interlacing arcs of light which had adorned the head of Kogia's comet were reproduced, while a curious dorsal spine of strong illumination formed the axis of the tail, which extended in clear skies over an arc of twenty degrees. It belonged to the same type as Donati's great plume, the particles composing it being driven from the sun by a force twice as powerful as that urging them towards it. But the appendage was, for a few nights, and by two observers perceived to be double. Temple, on June 27th, and Louis Boss at Albany, New York, June 26 and 28, saw a long straight ray corresponding to a far higher rate of emission than the curved train, and shown by Bredichin to be a member of the so-called hydrogen class. It had vanished by July 1st, but made a temporary reappearance July 22nd. The appendages of this comet were of remarkable transparency. Small stars shone wholly undimmed across the tail, and a very nearly central transit of the head over one of the seventh magnitude on the night of June twenty ninth produced, if any change, an increase of brilliancy in the object of this spontaneous experiment. Dr. Meyer, indeed, at the Geneva Observatory, detected apparent signs of refractive action upon rays thus transmitted, but his observations remain isolated and were presumably illusory. The track pursued by this comet gave peculiar advantages for its observation. Ascending from Ariga through Camelopardis, it stood, July 19th, on a line between the pointers and the pole within eight degrees of the latter, and thus remained for a lengthened period constantly above the horizon of northern observers. Its brightness, too, was no transient blaze, but had a lasting quality which enabled it to be kept steadily in view during nearly nine months. Visible to the naked eye until the end of August, the last telescopic observation of it was made February 14, 1882, when its distance from the Earth considerably exceeded 300 miles. Under these circumstances, the knowledge acquired of its orbit was of more than usual accuracy, and showed conclusively that the comet was not a simple return of Bessel's, for this would involve a period of 74 years, whereas Tebbet's comet cannot revisit the sun until after the lapse of two and a half millenniums. Nevertheless, the twin bodies move so nearly in the same path that an original connection of some kind is obvious, and the recent example of Biela, 
readily suggested a conjecture as to what the nature of that connection might have been. The comets of 1807 and 1881 are, then, regarded with much probability as fragments of a primitive, disrupted body, one following in the wake of the other at an interval of seventy-four years. Imperfect photographs were taken of Donati's comet both in England and America, but Tebbit's comet was the first to which the process was satisfactorily applied. The difficulties to be overcome were very great. The chemical intensity of cometary light is, to begin with, extraordinarily small. Janssen estimated it at one three hundred thousandth of moonlight. Hence, if the ordinary process by which lunar photographs are taken had been applied to the comet of 1881, an exposure of at least three days would have been required in order to get an impression of the head with about a tenth part of the tail. But by that time a new method of vastly increased sensitiveness had been rendered available, by which dried gelatin plates were substituted for the wet collodion plates hitherto in use and this improvement alone reduced the necessary time of exposure to two hours. It was brought down to half an hour by Janssen's employment of a reflector, specially adapted, to give an image illuminated eight or ten times as strongly as that produced in the focus of an ordinary telescope. The photographic feebleness of cometary rays was not the only obstacle in the way of success. The proper motion of these bodies is so rapid as to render the usual devices for keeping a heavenly body steadily in view quite inapplicable. The machinery by which the diurnal movement of the sphere is followed must be especially modified to suit each eccentric career. This too was done, and on June 30, 1881, Janssen secured a perfect photograph of the brilliant object then visible showing the structure of the tail with beautiful distinctness to a distance of two and a half degrees from the head an impression to nearly ten degrees was obtained about the same time by dr henry draper at new york with an exposure of a hundred and sixty-two minutes tebbets was also the first comet of which the spectrum was so much as attempted to be chemically recorded both huygens and draper were successful in this respect but Huygens was more completely so. The importance of the feat consisted in its throwing open to investigation a part of the spectrum invisible to the eye, and so affording an additional test of cometary constitution. The result was fully to confirm the origin from carbon compounds assigned to the visible rays by disclosing additional bands belonging to the same series in the ultraviolet as well as to establish unmistakably the presence of a not inconsiderable proportion of reflected solar light by the clear impression of some of the principal Fraunhofer lines. Thus the polariscope was found to have told the truth, though not the whole truth. The photograph so satisfactorily communicative was taken by Sir William Huggins on the night of June 24th, and on the 29th at Greenwich, the tail-tail Fraunhofer lines were perceived to interrupt the visible range of the spectrum. This was at first so vividly continuous that the characteristic cometary bands could scarcely be detached from their bright background. But as the nucleus faded towards the end of June, they came out strongly and were more and more clearly seen, both at Greenwich and at Princeton, to agree not with the spectrum of hydrocarbons glowing in a vacuum tube, but with that of the same substances burning in a Bunsen flame. It need not, however, be inferred that cometary materials are really in a state of combustion. This, from all that we know, may be called an impossibility. The additional clue furnished was rather to the manner of their electrical illumination. The spectrum of the tail was, in this comet, found to be not essentially different from that of the head. Professor Wright of Yale College, ascertained a large percentage of its light to be polarized in a plane passing through the sun, and hence to be reflected sunlight. A faint, continuous spectrum corresponded to this portion of its radiance, but gaseous emissions were also present. At Potsdam, on June 30th, 
the hydrocarbon bands were indeed traced by Fogel to the very end of the tail, and they were kept in sight by Young at a greater distance from the nucleus than the more equably dispersed light. There seems little doubt that, as in the solar corona, the relative strength of the two orders of spectra is subject to fluctuations. The comet of 1881-3 was thus of signal service to science. It afforded, when compared with the comet of 1807, the first undeniable example of two such bodies traveling so nearly in the same orbit as to leave absolutely no doubt of their existence of a genetic tie between them and cometary spectroscopy made a notable advance by means of it before it was yet out of sight it was provided with a successor end of part two chapter eleven part one recording by aaron carlo in san clemente california